a more dynamic flying environment where you'll see more than 4,000 different airfields that are available to us in the United States alone, vice the 400 that are served by airlines. Most pilots don't understand what career opportunities are available in the world of aviation. They're making career decisions based on advice from friends or posts on internet forums. Meaning they are taking huge risks with their livelihood without having all the details. This podcast was created to help you understand the aviation industry so you can find your dream job. Let's get ready for pushback. Here's your host and my dad, Nick Fialka. Hey, pilot, what is up? Good Monday to you. Another interview episode today is one of a couple episodes that I'm going to have about FlexJet. I don't know why, but over the past six months or so, I have run into so many interesting FlexJet people and everybody wants to be on the show and everybody wants to offer pilots and give to pilots and help pilots with what they need. And this interview with Zach DiGiovanni is exactly that. Zach is a pilot at Flex. He is an interviewer. He is a new father. He is a military pilot and all sorts of great things. He's had a great wealth of experience. And we just talk all about what it's like at FlexJet and all of the different things that are so interesting about it and what to expect and ups and downs and all that stuff. So I hope you enjoy it. I hope that it's a value. And why don't you let me know? Send me an email, podcast at spitfireleak.com. Maybe you know of another person that you would like me to interview or you have an idea for a solo episode. I'm happy to hear it. I talk to everybody. You have a question about your life, about your situation. Maybe you need to be on the show. I don't know. Reach out. Love to chat with you. So sit back and relax and enjoy. And last but not least, let's have a quick word from our sponsors because without them, we wouldn't have this awesome podcast. Hey, pilot, it's Nick. I want to tell you about a great friend of the show, Timothy P. Pope. He's a financial planner and he's completely focused on the professional pilot. He's the kind of guy you want to go to for real talk to help you figure out your financial future. With so many upgrades and so many transitions and so many things going on, you owe it to yourself to give him a call. He'll help you design and execute really smart financial planning strategies, whether it's retirement planning, investment management, military transition, tax planning. He's a great financial planning partner. Timothy P. Pope, CFP, helping professional pilots make the most out of life. Give him a shout. All the information's in the show notes. You should definitely tell him I told you to call. What's up? It's Tron Wood from Spitfire Lee here, and we are back with yet another one. Another one. Yep, we're giving you exclusive access to another unprecedented conversation with one of the best in the business. If you're considering American Airlines, you do not want to miss our conversation with American's Director of Pilot Recruiting and Development, Corey Glenn, on Wednesday, July 26th at 8 p.m. Now listen, no matter where you are in your pilot career, this is the event for you. And trust me, you won't get this level of unfiltered access anywhere else. Ah, So go ahead right now and click the link below and secure your spot so that you can be in the place Wednesday, July 26th to get the information directly from the source. You won't want to miss this. We'll see you guys. All right, everybody. I'm with my good buddy, Zach DiGiovanni. What's up, man? How are you? Good, man. How are you? Dude, I am good. I'm so glad to have you on this podcast. It's always fun to have a friend on here. And I am really glad that you came on because I think that the pilot listening here who has so many options in front of them, everybody's telling him or her to go to the airline and go fly that wide body and go do that thing. But you've got a different take on it, man. And I want to hear your story. So Zach and I used to be colleagues together and we used to fly at Envoy, right? That's right. Talk to me. Tell me a little bit about your experience, like why you decided to go to the regionals and what your thought process was like when you were just kicking it off. Sure. 
Yeah, man. So I uh, went to the regionals because I actually went through a rotor transition program through Coast Flight Training. I found out about that through a couple of different channels. First time I heard about it was in 2016, I was doing RIMPAC. What's RIMPAC? What's RIMPAC? RIMPAC happens every two years, a multinational exercise for the military. Okay. So it's like a big military exercise with like lots of people participating. Right. Cool. So I decided to do a couple of weeks there as part of the Navy contingent, which was fun. And one of my older colleagues was telling us about a program in which helicopter pilots got the skills and experience necessary to take their experience from rotary to the fixed wing side and be a commercial pilot with a regional airline. Okay. And I'm sitting there going, well, I think it was November of that same year. This was 2016. I got reached out to via LinkedIn from somebody at Coast Flight saying, hey, we noticed that you're a military helicopter pilot. Would you be interested in flying for a regional airline? Coast reached out to you. Yes. On LinkedIn. On LinkedIn. Because your network was legit. Good job, man. Thanks, dude. Yeah, man. <laughs> I mean, granted, I thought this was no way in hell is going to happen. I had less than 1,500 hours. I did not know about the restricted ATP minimums. So I was like, okay, shot in the dark, but why not? Give it a shot. I sent the application in. They called me within the hour <laughs> setting up an interview with Envoy. So I go to interview in December 2016 okay. at Envoy. And I got my conditional job offer just before Christmas. And I was going to be going to Coast to start my RTP journey in July, 2017. Okay. So between July and October, I was doing time building to start out and uh, did my multi-engine add-on because I already had my commercial single engine okay. license. So I just need a multi-part. And then I did ATP CTP, which is five day required course before anybody gets an airline transport pilot. And the biggest waste of time and waste of money. And I should open up my own ATP flight school just so I can let the fun. FAA hear you say that. Man, listen, FAA, I know you're listening. <laughs> it's the dumbest. Like, I've never poked myself in the eye for so long, ATP CTP. All right, continue. Sorry to interrupt there. I got to help. No, no, you're good. You're good. This is great color commentary. Everybody <laughs> needs to know what's going on. So after that, I took the test and I started Envoy November 20th of 2017. Okay. So November 2017, you started at Envoy. So it was a little less than a year for you to get there, but you didn't really start until six months in. So it kind of took you six months to get from like maybe even five months to get from point A to point B. When you were there at Coast, do you feel like you were like trying really hard to hustle and all that stuff? Or were you just kind of like on the easy train? Oh, I was definitely pushing because I wanted to fly as much as possible, as quickly as possible to get through the program and get started with the airline. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about what it's like, right? So here you are, new guy at Envoy and mm -hmm. you've been at Coast. You flew in the military and helicopters. Right. You have some experience. Did you fly a helicopter with a glass cockpit or with steam gauges? 60 Romeo did have a glass cockpit. Yeah. Okay, cool. So what was it like jumping in there and kind of getting things sorted as you went through this training program at Envoy, having done coast and having done military stuff? A little bit of a quantum leap because the last time I did a fixed wing of any sort before coast was a T6 back in my primary flight days. Now the T6 was a very fast turboprop trainer but it did not compare to a jet. So the Embraer 145 was my very first jet. Yeah. And it doesn't have auto throttles and it does not. It likes to overspeed on you and all that other stuff. And it's super slippery. Gosh, did you kind of pace through you and your sim partner, like really buckled in and figure stuff out? Or were you just kind of like bouncing around the Bedford Holiday Inn, like trying to wonder which way's up? It was a little bit of bouncing around, but I think that we got our bearings pretty quickly. For me, at least, it was very much getting back into that mode of when I was a student in the military, diving as deep as I could into the, the material, trying to get myself as familiar with the airplane as possible being as smart as I could, as quickly as I could. So that way I would have that foundation that I needed to be a success in the Sims. So I think I was able to pick things up pretty quickly. And then when I got to the Sim, of course, it was a humbling experience for ride one, two, and let's say maybe even three. But by three, I was starting to get my feet underneath me. And then rides four, five, and six were great because 
the complexity went up, but I was also steeped enough in my previous mistakes where I was like, okay, I can handle this now. This will be fine. Yeah. I think that there are three parts when I kind of look back on that one initial 121 training is... Oh, that's right. Yeah. The number one thing would be learning the flows and call outs, right? Mm -hmm. In the 145, they made absolutely no sense. They don't follow a pattern. (laughs) It's just like disparate. And you're like, what in the hell is going on? My life currently at the major airline that I fly out, I fly an Airbus and it just felt like it's like step one is over your head and step two is two inches below that. And step three is two inches below that. And then we move on. It's like all in order. It's all ergonomic. But the 145 man, I mean, it looks like one of those like Bugs Bunny cartoons where the hands are blurry because you're going every which way. So it call, flows and call outs, right? Mm-hmm. And you barely have a handle on all of that. And then you have to start learning the FMS. And the FMS is the computer and you're punching the box. That's right. Also, that FMS on the 145 made no sense. Terrible. Terrible. (laughs) Terrible. God, it was so bad. (laughs) It was very bad. But that said, at least gave you a basis on what to expect going forward. Like FMS is an FMS is an FMS. It has a basic functions. You just need to know where to push the buttons. That's really where it comes down to. Yes. And so once you memorize the patterns there and you mm-hmm. memorize the patterns for your flows, and then you remember your call outs and you start piecing that together. Then the third piece I think is like the actual maneuvers of actually flying the plane, which is probably the easiest part. And it's very funny because I think that people struggle with managing that FMS at the same time they're trying to fly the plane, right? Yep. Gosh, and it's tricky. And then you have one thing off and it's all everywhere. So it behooves you to be really cool to your sim partners so that you have a really good pilot monitoring that can help you bail you out. All right, so you got through training, you got to the line, and how long were you at Envoy? How long did you spend? My total tenure at Envoy was just shy of four years. So started November 2017, and I left September of 21. Okay, so very similar glide slope to me, right? Almost exactly the same time frame that we were there. Yep. You spent four years flying it. What were your kind of sentiments and thoughts about the whole line process flying out of? Did you live in base? Mostly no. I did a little bit. I was DFW based for about, I'd say a grand total of eight months of the four I was there. So you commuted. I did. Okay. So you commuted to work and you flew the line. So talk to me about what that experience is like. Absolutely. So initially I was Chicago based first officer and that was really difficult from a commuting front, but DFW being hub to hub, it made it pretty easy to find multiple flights a day. When I switched over to being New York based, it did become a little bit easier. Now, I made it a conscious decision to be New York based for a couple of reasons. I was senior enough where I could hold the line and there was a lot more flying to be had in the New York system. So I could get the hours I needed to be a captain that much quicker. You know, be living in DFW and then later on in Houston with the beautiful woman who's now my wife. Commuting to New York was pretty easy from both of those major hubs because they were served by American and United, and I jump seated on both. I was fortunate enough that I was able to find lines that I could start later in the day. So I would commute early in the morning. I would get there, grab a couple hour nap, and then start my rotation. And then the last day, I would be early enough that I could get home and not have to spend any money out of pocket, go find a commuter hotel, a crash pad. And then there was the odd occasion where I would stop in JFK at about nine o'clock at night. And the only way home was to jump seat on FedEx, which was a very eye-opening experience. I enjoyed the process it took to kind of get familiar with that, to be able to check in, catch that ride, go through Memphis at the backside of the clock and to see how FedEx did their business. So it was a little bit of a good thing that I had that because it gave me something to think about, pros and cons about that particular company for a future career. So all in all, the commuting process for me worked out pretty well up until my last year or so. Everyone knows what happened in 2020. And I just happened to hit that crease where I was upgrading onto the 175, going to be Chicago based. Before COVID, I was going to be a junior line holder on the biggest jet we had in our fleet. And I would be getting tons of hours, and I thought I was going to be out there quick. 
Then COVID happened <laughs> and the schedule in O'Hare in particular got decimated. Yep. All the 175 flying was going in and out of DFW. So I spent a majority of my time in my crash pad in Chicago, which I was very fortunate to find that particular situation. It made it very comfortable. It made it very easy because I didn't get more than 99 hours post IOE on the E-175. Oh, my God. Yeah. So yeah. let's get into the meat of really what we're going to talk about, right? You decided to make a switch. Like everybody's trying to get out of the regionals and go to the next greatest thing. And most people are focused on getting to a major airline, but your focus was FlexJet. First off, let's talk about the calculus of FlexJet. And then I want to talk about what it was like to interview there. So the calculus of FlexJet for me was born of my commuting. The opportunity to sit in the front with the captain and the first officer, either with American or United Pilots, I got to see and discuss with them a lot of the pros and cons of being at a major 121 carrier. The pros were obviously compensation, retirement, contribution, and when you're senior enough, being able to dictate your schedule with a little more flexibility. That said, it seemed to me as if the cons were greater in scale because of union disputes or company culture. It was very disheartening to hear people who had been with the company what I would say, the dance for us regional guys. Right. And they're not happy. So being that I was 35 years old in 2021, I had a very, very difficult decision to make. Do I gun for the 121, which is what everyone says is the golden path, or do I take the alternative? And in March of 21, one of my good buddies from Envoy, he interviewed with FlexJet and told me some of the good pieces of information he gleaned from that candidate interview process to include a more dynamic flying environment where you'll see more than 4,000 different airfields that are available to us in the United States alone, vice the 400 that are served by airlines, whether it be majors or regionals. 4,000 air. What's that? Four th- how many of the 4,000 airfields have you been 4, to? 4,000. I have not been to all of them, but I will tell you this. I have been to some places that you wouldn't think a business jet would be able to fly into. I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt. Continue, please. No, you're good, man. You're good. The other things he told me about were the compensation for a first officer well exceeded at that time the first year compensation for a new hire at American, at United, at Delta, Southwest. It made me stop and think a little bit. The biggest thing he told me was the guys who were there presenting all this information were 20 plus year veterans of FlexJet. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the director of training. We're talking about the VP of the Red Label programs. We're talking about the manager of training. All these guys have been with the company for a very, very long time and they all stuck around and they're all very happy. So that's one of the biggest things that kind of came into my mind. So you had on one side, your commuting, your jump seating, you're talking to these United and American pilots, and there's a lot of like frustration and disgruntledness. On the other right. side, everything from FlexJet is indicating like guys are sticking around and they're still pretty stoked. Yeah. All right. Absolutely. I mean, we'll get more into the details of some of the cool perks and bennies that are winners as far as like, you know, side benefits, but the biggest things being a great first year compensation package and going up from there. And then just the overall quality of life, the happiness of the pilots is like, that's what we all seek. And I get that quality of life is different from one pilot to another. But for me, I would much rather for the next 30 years of my career, be happy to go to work as opposed to disgruntled and upset, whatever the case may be. Yeah, I think about the Lego, <laughs> Lego cartoon. Ah, uh, yes. I should put that in the show notes. If you haven't seen the Lego cartoons, that guy's a genius. It's all about Lego. Living the dream. Airlines. <laughs> Living the dream. Work, work. Oh, man. Genius. So good. I got to find that. All right. So things are sounding mm-hmm. good. And so did you cold apply and just kind of wait around? Did you get out there and get moving and try to work your way in? Like, how did you? I cold applied. And at the time, the only recruiter that was on the pilot side was a fantastic lady by the name of Marie Gill. And I had just hit that luck and timing point where she went out on maternity leave with her first baby. So I had to wait a few months. 
But I was in close contact with Tony Cordopassi, who was one of the RTAG guys on campus at FlexJet working with the recruitment department. He assured me time and time again, dude, just hang on. Marie's going to get back to you. And she finally did. And so we had a short conversation. She asked me some particulars about what the background of my flying and aviation career looked like and what my motivations were for applying with FlexJet. And if I was going to be entertaining a path in 121, there's a reason why I'm applying to you guys. Listen, being getting stuck mm-hmm. in a crash pad and commuting and being away from because you're newly married and right. all these things and I totally right now, <laughs> it sucks for sure. Yeah. All right. So they call they you did. for an interview. Yeah. They interview at the CAE facility on DFW West and it's a two-parter. I would say a three-parter. The first part is they do a group in brief where they do names, you know, short introduction, airframes you've flown, and an interesting fact about yourself, which I thought was a really cool and fun exercise. And it really speaks to the culture of FlexJet. They know you can fly, but they also want to hire for personality. Was anybody like interesting fact is like I spent four years in a Mexican prison or any weird facts about themselves? Like I, that? Honestly, I don't remember any factoids from the classes or the candy class that I was with. But later on, I would do interviews from the FlexJet side. And a lot of people have some very interesting factoids. Can you share one? Do you know? Let me see. If you can believe it, there's a guy who started flying after having a successful cement business. <laughs> I love it. Listen, let's right? go. That's so fun. Yeah, absolutely. Like, give that guy a job. That guy knows how to work. Dude, let's go, man. If you're driving in your cement truck right now, listening to this podcast, you send me an email. Like, I will get you <laughs> to Flex. I will get you. I want to know. We're like, landscaping company, like, plumbers, electricians, like there's so many cool jobs, like people work and then they're ready to make that change. And that's just it. I love it, man. Damn, that guy's awesome. And it gets me jazzed. I see the things on Facebook groups that we're part of and people are always asking, hey, I'm 50 something and I'm thinking about changing careers. Is it too late for me? And everyone with a resounding, no, it's not too late. That's right. Get your stuff in, keep it going. Let's go. And it's so worthwhile. For sure. Like it's a hard job. But it's a great. It job. is. It is incredibly challenging but rewarding. Such a big oh, so yeah. yeah, the biggest thing there is just like they want to get to know who you are and find out what your personality is like. Because at the end of the day, they're hiring someone that they can spend eight days in the same flight deck with. Yeah, that's it. And eight days is. A, I mean, that's a long time. It sure After, is. Like if you're flying in the regionals, you're probably used to three or four that's right. days. And then you have that one five day, and you're like. You're ready to jump out of the airplane by the time you're like at the end of that. And you're like, good God, this is misery. But an eight day, it's but it's a different experience. It really right? is. When you're, and why? Why is it so different? I will tell you that the biggest thing that makes it a more palatable time on the road, despite how long it sounds, uh, you gave the example of doing four day rotations being DFW based 145 captain with Envoy. Four or five legs was the norm. We would do out and backs until we were blue in the face for four days. Yeah, and then an overnight. Then an overnight at Wichita, or was it San Angelo, Abilene? Abilene. Abilene. So we would just get worked, and the turnarounds were always quick. It was always a flurry of motion. With flex, 30 minute turns. 25 now. Yep. Uh, y'all mm-hmm. regionals, man. My heart is out to you. I love you. Just yep. keep working. It's worth it. Keep the other side. Yep. It's worth it. Let's go. We've been there, done that. We understand the pain, but stay hungry because the best times are coming. Yeah. Get your apps in. Give me a call. That's it. So yeah, I mean, it was an exhausting four days. And by the end of it, I was basically flopping my face onto my bed at home. And then I wake up and then, oh crap, I have to do my laundry and get ready for the next one. But it flexed yet. Yeah. Even though I didn't have to do eight days in a row because I was DFW based, I chose to for a couple of reasons. One, it got me the baseline compensation that they calculate for is an average of 16 days or 15 and a half to 16 days per bid period. And then I can get two trips knocked out, be done for the month and have six days in between. So longer time on the road, but also longer time at home. Also, the working conditions at FlexJet were very different. 
I mean, you're flying a business jet, you're flying fewer people, you don't have these rush turnarounds. And while this is all going on, you're getting catered meals if you're working, and you're getting better treatment from the ground personnel at the FBOs. And say about 40% of our flying is empty positioning legs. So it's a really a chance for you to just kind of relax, take a breather, catch up on some of the cleaning if you're doing a really tight turn, or it's just going to be like one of those long transcons getting you to your next place. It's not as intense. I mean, we're doing maybe two to three legs on average on the Challenger fleet at the time. Now, granted, it's ramped up a little bit and we're seeing a lot more demand at this point, but when I started, it wasn't as hectic as it had been when I was at Envoy. So a little more relaxed, a little less frenetic, and the push, push, push is not there. Yeah. And I'll tell you, it's interesting, right? Zach and I started basically the same time. And we met at Envoy, like we were a couple weeks apart in hiring and we left (laughs) a couple weeks apart. (laughs) And also Zach got married at the beginning of COVID. He's the first person I met He's the first person I saw. He got married, like he had a huge wedding plan and all this and got married at your house, right? And my mother in law. Yeah. And the neighbors like did up the house and got up. It was so yeah. cool. Like, God, it's just the cutest damn thing you ever <laughs> saw. And like my wife and I were watching like the pictures and stuff. And we're like, gosh, you know, it's so sad that you're like having to get married during COVID because you can't do that. But then I'm like, dang, like what an experience, Absolutely. you know? So. I digress a little bit. (laughs) The point I was trying to make, which I totally got sidetracked on, is the fact that like I dig what I do. I love it. And you dig what Mm -hmm. you do and you love it. When you get to the regional and you start flying, first off, your eyes, you're so excited. And it's just just great. And it probably takes, I would say, every job, you've got about a six-month honeymoon period before like regular Mm -hmm. life starts to set in. And so after you are there for six months especially if you're commuting and doing all these things, like it can certainly start to wear on you and you've got to do those things like to keep yourself motivated, to know that like there's an end in sight. And then once you're able, like getting into the monotony, I guess, of the day in, day out, five turns, 25 minute turns, like five a day to some side of the interstate overnight, at some crap hotel with a, it smells like cigarettes and there's one, like there's a treadmill in the front yard and that's the gym. (laughs) You're not lying. (laughs) I was like, what is this? A prison gym? It's like, they share it with the prison during certain hours. (laughs) (laughs) And then there's this total lifestyle change where you're staying in nice hotels. I'm guessing you're staying in nice hotels, right? And do you get to keep the points at these hotels? Yes. That's one of the things I was going to get into. Sure. Sure. Let's go. The company does a great job of setting us up so that we are able to take advantage of the hotel points and airline miles. So for me, being a DFW guy, I do a lot of trips on American and I'm able to get those miles, get the status that goes with it. And I think I'm pretty much knocking on the door of being a platinum for the next year. Oh man, that's cool. And there's a lot of value Mm -hmm. in it for sure. And a lot of extra cool benefits. And so you start getting paid from the first day, right? Like, is that because they always say like, it's not a commute because you're getting paid. Uh, That's right. I mean, the great thing about it is when your duty clock starts, day one is typically going to be your travel day. And then day last will be your go home day. There will never be an occasion where they're going to junior man you or extend you against your will. They'll throw it out there and say, hey, do you want to volunteer to extend? And we'll pay you overtime for it. But if you say no, they'll find someone else who's willing. Yeah, and junior manning for those of you who have not gotten punched in the face. <laughs> it is a punch in the face. Man, it's mm-hmm. the worst. So you're done with your five day and you get a call from crew scheduling and they're like, guess what? We've got one more flight for you and you are the only person available, so you yep. have to take it. You can be like, No, I've gotta take my child to the emergency room because their arm came off and they'll be like, No, I'm sorry, you've got to fly this flight. And that's a junior man. Like if you turn it down, you're probably going to be sitting in the chief pilot's Mm -hmm. office. And that's some Yes. Like, but it's what's up. Like, and that's written in the contract. So, hey, all y'all that are negotiating all these great contracts right now, let's get rid of that. Yeah. Let's drop that. Yeah, for sure. But you the opportunity, right? You get Mm -hmm. a chance to, hey, we got some extra cash. We want to throw your way. 
you're going to get another hotel mm-hmm. for you an overnight and you get some more points and you'll still get frequent flyer mile that's right on your way home so have you been using those points going to some like fancy locations and staying at the ritz not yet i'm still trying to build my little nest egg for that and there hasn't really been an occasion where we've needed to dip into that eventually yes soon soon yeah right. but that'll be late next year because we're welcoming baby number two in january Heck yeah. Well, so what's a paternity leave look good? What's it look like? So I actually can speak a little bit to that because this past January was when my son was born. And when I was going through that, I talked to the company early on about the fact that this was going to be happening. And of course, the first response is, oh my gosh, congratulations. We're so absolutely thrilled for you. Here's what we're going to do, or here's what we're going to need. <laughs> yeah, junior man. Here's a junior man. <laughs> Screw you now and they reward you later. <laughs> the company is a fantastic family first culture and they actually do stand by that. Going off track just a little bit, there are numerous anecdotes of how the company went above and beyond for their people, for family situations. The biggest thing I've heard, is, especially for new parents like myself, they would tell a crew, hey, fly the jet to the nearest airport to the hospital where your wife's at. I kid you not. And this has happened on more than one occasion. Wow. And there are bigger and more philanthropic examples. So the biggest thing being there was a pilot whose cousin was trapped in Puerto Rico because of that hurricane that hit. And this cousin needed dialysis and they weren't able to do it because obviously there was no power. And so, they, hey, listen, I don't care what it costs. Can I charter one of our jets to go down there and get my cousin? The company initially said no. And you're sitting going, but wait. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to load up this jet with as much humanitarian relief and aid and supplies as you can take down there, drop it off, and then you take your cousin and family out of there on our jet to a hospital. Yes. And these are no BS stories, by the way, people. These are 100% true, and you can verify them. But it just speaks to the culture that this company is. So back on track. There's no real paternity leave. So what I did was we were still kind of in a limbo period where we were doing the scheduling that they had initiated for COVID project lift. They were giving us opportunity to be able to schedule for two bid periods at a time. And what I did was I spoke with my scheduler said, Hey Dave, what do you think about establishing a two week on two week off rotation? My son is due on this day in January. And if I do that, I can do a trip all the way at the beginning of January, be off for the rest of the month, and then start again at the end of February. That would give me about a four or five week window to be home with my wife and my son in his first few weeks of life. So he said, yeah, man, absolutely. No problem. Got it done. And that did not have any impact on my pay. And it allowed me to be home with my family at a very crucial moment. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. important, man. My timing with my kiddos has always worked out well. Everybody's been on board and it's been, it's always one thing or another, but man, you got to take care of your spouse. For Definitely. That. Sure. That's awesome, man. So one of the other things, right? Just besides find the line, you also mm-hmm. do interviews, right? All right. So now you're on the other side of the coin and I want to know, I'm the pilot right. listening, right? You're talking directly to the person that you're probably going to interview mm-hmm. next week. So first off, what gouge, what intelligence <laughs> can you give them about the process? And then what do they need to know Certainly. to succeed? So I alluded to it earlier in the podcast about how this was like a three-part process. It was the group in brief where they introduce you to FlexJet and all its awesomeness. The second part is your HR panel which you sit down with the HR professional and another pilot or two pilots, whatever we have at our disposal at the time. And then you do a brief sim ride laid back. And again, it's just them wanting to get more information on who you are as a person. And for the pilot in the group or in the room, they're wanting to know, can I sit next to this person for a six, seven or eight day rotation? Are you asking questions like pre-gonculated questions that are kind of in front of you, or are you just kind of talking extemporaneously and asking some... It's more get-to-know-you questions. I mean, obviously, we do have a couple of what I'll call scripted questions to kind of frame out the experience part. Like, for example, what's some of the things you did at your previous job that you found fun? Or the biggest one we want to know about is, have you ever flown with a difficult captain? 
And how did you handle that? Oh, yeah. It That's is. a good one. I punched it. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah. Another big one for us is, do you have a good above and beyond customer service example? Now, we realize that in the regional, you're not given a whole lot of interaction with the passengers. In fact, your best customer service story will probably be, well, I pushed a wheelchair bound passenger from one gate to another. That's one we've heard, but we also want to get an idea of like what other customer service experience have you had before? There was a couple of really, really great stories from candidates I interviewed on the other side of the table about their above and beyonds. One of which was a gentleman who flew for the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. I tell you oh, yeah. what, I have never heard a more extraordinary above and beyond in my career. It was fantastic. I mean, the guy's talking about doing a mission planning for tracking this one particular whale or pod of whales with the scientists. It's like he could have just been like, okay, I'll fly whatever route they want me to. But no, he's in there with them trying to find the best way to go about it, how to interact with the instrumentation that they got on board, how to optimize it for them, and how to get them the best and clearest picture or the best, clearest idea of how to track this thing. It was extraordinary. I mean, I was just blown away. And the best part is he identified, like, when I think of customer, I think of a very transactional thing, but that's not it. And he dove deeper and really uncovered Yeah, that. I love that. That's such oh, a yeah. great story. And it's all that we're about when we go talk about our owners at FlexJet is we're trying to find ways to go above and beyond for every single one of them. I mean, it could be that it's an owner's very first trip on our metal, or it could be their birthday, or it could be a longtime owner who is going to a very, very important meeting. So we find ways to go above and beyond for them. For example, the birthday, just, just a thought, like if we give them a birthday card and a cupcake, of their favorite flavor. I mean, you can't put a price on the expression of that person when they see that. It's just like, they're like, oh, you thought about me that far in the head? That's that's great. That's important, man. Because it's awesome. Like, because everybody just wants some love. Everybody wants to be cared about. Definitely. That's it. So you do Mm -hmm. some HR and then you roll into a sim. Are they like, you practice in like, oh, no, no. Flight? Like, what are you guys doing? This is kind of where we get an idea of, can you be trained? We're not looking for perfection. We're not even looking for ACS standard. What kind? We have three that we currently use. We use a Challenger 601, a Falcon 50, or a Lear 45. Okay, so it could could be be one one of the three. And it all comes down to what's available at the time we do these interviews. Okay, is one harder to fly than the other? Okay, Okay. I'm not going to ask because I don't know. Challenger 601 is a hard one. (laughs) <laughs> I didn't yeah. want to know, but I didn't um, want to know. I flew that um, when I did my interview. Yeah, I'm already yeah. nervous about it. All right, so what All do you right. do? So the basic premise is this. You're sitting on runway 22 left at JFK in 400-foot ceilings, one-mile visibility, and you are flying raw okay. data, hand-flown, so no automation. Okay. You're taking off, and you're leveling off, at, I think, at 3,000 feet. You're doing a radar box pattern with the instructor giving you those vectors, you're going to be at some point handing the plane off to your seat fill to do an approach brief of the ILS to two, two left. And then you fly it down to a landing. Is there a good gouge power? No, I couldn't tell you, but there's more to it. (laughs) Oh man. At the end of that, they'll reposition you in a takeoff position to do a V one cut, which for the uninitiated is when you lose one engine on a multi-engine aircraft and you have to maintain runway center line, fly the aircraft up to a predetermined altitude at a certain speed and have a panic attack. Yes. All at the same time. time. Okay. Just straight up. You're doing the V one cut to altitude. Are you bringing it back around and landing it? Or are you just like straight up? They just want to see if you can handle a V one cut and fly it up to altitude. Listen, the key, y'all, get that boot in, get that rudder yep. set, and don't move it. Once it's set and you're realigned with the center line, don't try to get back to that center line. Keep it straight, keep the nose down the line, and just ease it off and be gentle. Be sweet to that little bird. Like that bird wants to fly. So, yeah. I mean, please, if I'm wrong, correct me. If you're off center line, they want you to try and get back to it before you rotate, but they just want to see can okay. you handle it. Yeah. Okay. So that's cool. the intelligence. You want the intelligence? Yeah. Yes. Right. Give me the, the biggest thing that we see on the sim portion, at least, is people getting fixated and not moving their scan. 
But that's the really big thing about it. Okay. And because there's no automation and like you, it's just you in the airplane. And by the way, uh, at least for the 601, it's got more power than you'd ever need. And that's what makes it challenging. You have to be on top of the trend vector for the airspeed and the altitude. You have to understand the relationship between where your power is and where you want it to be. So it's constantly moving that scan. Like, am I right side up? Cool, check my speed. Am I right side up? Cool, check my altitude. Am I right side up? Cool, check my power. Keep that moving. Keep that moving. And when it gets to the basics, basics, exactly. Unfortunately, a lot of the regionals are starting to go by the wayside. They push, push, push automation, and we're losing a lot of that basic aviation skill. So that's why we put such an emphasis on it at FlexJet. We want to make sure, can you handle this aircraft? Yeah, and that's the thing, right? Especially currently in a 121 world and you're, and you're going to make this move, you're going to have an aircraft that requires a lot more of your skill than something like a 175 would or that's a right. bus would. Where you can just trim out the tail for a couple seconds and then once the rudder trims in, you hit the autopilot and it manages the rest of it. You just move the heading knob. Like that's not where you are, especially when you're hand flying the sim. So do a lot of guys bust the sim? We have about a 50% success rate. That's right. 50%. That's a wide margin. Whew. I'm stressed out. No, no, you could, you could. There was a guy in my interview class. He got on with trans states just as they were shutting their doors. So he had gone a pretty wide period of time without flying. And he knew he was going to be doing the sim for FlexJet. So what did he do? On his own dime, he bought simulator time to give him the skills he needed to at least get through the sim portion. Yeah. And was he doing in a jet or did he like have a red bird that was some kind of smaller? I believe he bought kind of thing. Do you remember? full motion sim time in a jet of some sort to just get that practice in. Wow. Bro. Hey, I mean, what's this multi-million dollar career? Exactly. Right. If you're going to be a millionaire, like what kind of effort are you going to put? Sometimes it's transactional. That's like it. That. Boy. Right. Put on that guy. And he hopefully he did passed. pass. In fact, he's a phenom captain with us now. Yeah. All right. All right. Cool. Okay, so I did the HR with mm-hmm. you. I didn't say... <laughs> yeah, don't say an interview. Yeah, no, don't do that. And then I did my SIM and I didn't mess it up. And I was able to do the V1 cut and mm-hmm. ILS. Uh, so what's next the step, step is the pilot recruitment team will reach out to you. And now that Marie has some additional manpower in her department... Whoever was the recruiter that you spoke with prior to your interview will reach out to you and ask, hey, how'd it go? How do you feel? How'd the sim go? Blah, blah, blah. Make nice, nice talk. And then they'll give you the job offer. And it, we, we turn this around very, very quickly. It's within a couple of days of the interview. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. That's awesome. Is it a long time to wait to class up right now? Only because we're trying to fight for SIM slots. And it's also the end of the year where a lot of the schoolhouses are starting to draw down for the holidays. The other thing too is we're building a new facility down in Orlando where we have, I say it's in-house, but it's a company that we acquired. We have most of the fleet types for FlexJet there at this facility coming up. So we're going to have classrooms and SIMs We are going to get first pick, and obviously we're going to have other customers coming in to fill the rest of the slots, but it has been relatively quick for most fleet types where you start out is, when you're first hired, you're going to be one of fleet types. I'm I'm sure you had that question queued up, but I'm going to jump that to gun. You're either going to be a Phenom 300, a Legacy 550 or Praetor 600, or Challenger 300, 350, or now 3500, second in command when you first start. Man, so you go through, I know we're pushing the link this conversation, but I really think this is such a information. And I feel like the pilot listening is is probably just as interested if he's hung out for the past <laughs> 50 minutes. So. <laughs> so after you start training, like what was your training experience? Like? It was actually very similar to the structure that we encountered at Envoy with the exception of it was very accelerated. We did pretty much all the ground school and SIMS Within, I would say, a three to four week period. Yeah, it is a lot. Now, granted, we did have a day break in between the ground school and sim portions, but most of it was exactly the same as what we encountered at the regional. There was ground school, you go through systems, then you do a procedure trainer in the afternoon or vice versa, whatever the case may be. And then you do all your sim sessions pretty much back to back to back to back. 
Yeah, that's pretty exhausting, but it's worth it. Get it done, get it over with, get it moving. So do you have any tips for people that are like targeting FlexJet that really want to work there that are trying to figure out a way to break out and to show who they are, that they are a great candidate? Do you have any tips for them? The biggest thing is having that customer service mindset and that heart and that desire. Because at the core of our company, we are customer service that just happens to fly jets. Yeah, that's right. It's a customer mm-hmm. service company. Like that's just, yeah, absolutely. What question am I forgetting to ask you? A lot of people that I've talked to just off the cuff have asked me a lot about some of the other things we do at Flex that are different. So we use the two of us as an example. At Delta, you get your per diem and probably not a lot. <laughs> and that's what you get to spend each night on your dinner with your crew. But that's stuff that comes out of your pocket, right? Right. Actually, I have a can of tuna that I eat so that I can afford to uh, keep the kids. There you go, folks. Delta FO is eating a can of tuna on the road. (laughs) And a guy eating tuna on the road. (laughs) So one of the cool things about working at FlexJet is when you're on the road, you do get a per diem. That said, you don't have to use that because you have a company card that allows you to expense meals on the road. Yeah. talking about. Do you get points on that card? Not that card. Not that card. You don't get to earn those points. But it's because of you having that card, we do switch it over to our hotels to that card to then earn the hotel points and airline miles as well. And so that per diem ends up being money in your pocket, which if you do the average, like I was saying, about 16 days per bid period, that works out to be another $8,000 in your pocket. That's non-taxable. That's true. That's mm-hmm. a really good point. It's double not taxable because you're not paying the That's sales right. tax either. Yeah. 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 We do have a couple of bonus programs. There's the discretionary bonus. There's also the performance bonus. And those are a little bit nebulous, but typically you see about 10% on that as a uh, first officer. You also get a fuel bonus. So if you fly the jet the way they uh, tell you to, which is how we train it, you're always going to make that fuel bonus. So you get extra mm-hmm. money if you can serve fuel, like you kind of have a target fuel number. You're uh, basically, it's just like flying the jet on an optimized profile. And we do teach how to do that optimized profile. Now, that said, there's some like tech seizures that will be taught to you by senior guys that help you increase that a little bit more. As long as you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, you're going to be fine. And you're going to have an extra little bit of chunk of change in your pocket. So Oh, net, net. The big thing they're asking is like, what's your gross compensation your first year? If you do everything right, you're looking at about 125 to 130 K in compensation your first year. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. That was better. <laughs> <laughs> yep. The other things that people want to know about are the red label programs. So we have two sides of that house. There's domestic red label, which is completely seniority driven. And what that means is you and two other captains when your seniority number comes up, will get dedicated to one tail number. And you basically run that as your own little business together. As long as the captain's seat is filled, the company is going to supply the first officers to you. And those are existing on the legacy and the challenger fleets at present. Oh, by the way, the lowest seniority person we have doing domestic red label has been on property just under three years. Oh man, so it's cool. It's got a lot quicker. It used to be five when I was on um, New Hire last year. It's dropped significantly. And with our plans to expand, it will continue to come down. The other side, International Large Cabin, which I got into earlier this year, the Gulfstream G450, Gulfstream G650, and Bombardier Global Express on that side of the house. Now, unlike the Messick Red Label, this one is not seniority driven. It's all about Do you stand out as a first officer, as a go-getter, as someone who is really a good team member, a good personality, and networking? It comes down to networking. Networking and likability, man. That's it. That's everything in life, dude. Oh, yeah. So So when you're on that side of the house, you are part of a team of five people manning two seats on that jet. You also get a cabin server that you're working with now, whose main job is to take care of the owners in the back. But... At the end of the day, all three of you are working together to make sure that that plane is in tip-top shape for the rest of the day or the next day. And it really does become a really fun dynamic. The personalities that we work with, we have great cabin servers, both on property and contract. 
it's a lot like working at the regional again. Yeah, of course you got selected to go do that. I'm not surprised. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Dude. So you talked about eight days on and all that, like what's the schedule look like? How does that work? All right. So scheduling is very much a product of how you want your month to look. And I say that because we have preferential bid system. Now, unlike preferential bid system at the airlines, ours works a little bit different. It is very simple. What days do you want on? What days do you want off? And depending on which base you have as your domicile, which we have 100 domiciles across the entire country, and none of them are seniority driven. All it is is giving us a way to figure out where to start and stop your duty rotations. So it's just kind of proximate. Right. So, for example, I'm DFW based. So, for me, it's one of seven primary domiciles. We can go down to as few as four days on in a row. But most places outside of a primary domicile, you're looking at about a minimum of six to seven days. Basically, because they want to kind of get you there and keep you going, I guess. Is it a cost thing? Is it just like that's just kind of the nature of the beast? Yeah, it's a little bit of a cost thing. And there's a lot more people living in a primary domicile like DFW or Denver or LA versus, let's say, Durango, Colorado. Yeah, I'd love to live in Durango. It'd be sweet. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So to give you an idea, we have what I can chew far into the weeds. There's lines that you can be scheduled for if you don't put in a bid. And then there's lines that you have to bid for in order to be given that schedule. Okay. So for an example, even though I didn't have to do it being DFW based, I would typically do eight on six off. And that's a typical rotation you would see at other part 135 carriers. But for us, it comes down to, do you want to have a more consistent schedule or do you want to like, for example, just have a couple days off here because you know your wife wants to have a girl's day with her friends. And so you'd be home to watch the kiddos or do you have a special occasion that you're trying to maneuver around? So all that to say, there's a lot more flexibility with PBS scheduling at FlexJet. And it all comes down to, do you want to be on this day or do you want to be off this day? And oh, by the way, days off are sacrosanct. Oh, big word. <laughs> I blacked out. What happened? Oh my God. <laughs> so I think that means like we don't mess with it. Correct. That's good. Mm-hmm. Are you bidding certain trip? Oh, I know I want to take this bird to this location for this overnight because I really like the steak dinner there. No. In fact, you have no idea of where you're going until about the day prior. Okay. Do you like that? I do. For me, it gives me a little bit more variety and also a little more of a sense of adventure. When I was with the regional, we would go to the same places all the time. And yes, I would typically bid for overnights that I enjoyed. Now, given the state of the industry today, more often than not, you're getting a reassignment left and right. So that overnight that you were counting on is now changed because, well, a plane is broke or crew fatigued out or wherever the case may be, and you're going somewhere different anyway. For me, not a problem. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really good point. And that's the good part about that and having the opportunity just to mix it up. I mean, plus, what did you say? 4,000 different potential airfields. You that's, right. To be- that's right. That's so right. It's controlled and uncontrolled. Uh, any dirt strips? Not yet. Good. Yeah. Nothing down in Bogota. Anything crazy? No, no, not yet. I, mean, I probably won't be doing dirt strips for a while on the Gulf Stream. So <laughs> <laughs> you can do it once. Oh man, that's right. Cool. Anything else about scheduling that we should be smart on? I'm trying to think off the cuff here, I and mean, that's honestly the biggest one is like being able to manipulate which days on, which days off you want, and pick from hundreds of different lines to accommodate that. All right. Cool. Well, listen, Zach. Thank you so much. This is Zach DiGiovanni, FlexJet. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for pouring into the pilot about all the good things that FlexJet is. And you know what? Like when you see him in your interview, make sure you tell him you heard it here. Like that's so good, man. Buddy, thank you for being here. Thank you for all your information. Hey, thanks for having me. All right, dude. See ya. Bye. Hey, before I let you go, I need to mention one thing because a lot of people are asking me, Can you do anything? Can you help me with this? And the answer is yes. At Spitfire Elite, we will make more millionaires this year 
than Major League Baseball will make in the next five years. Our company actually does this. It's called Spitfire Elite Interview Consulting. And you can find us over at SpitfireElite.com. Our clients, they call us the easy button for interview prep because everything you need to crush your interview is there in one spot. Whether it's application review or interview prep, all of it is covered. We've helped thousands of clients who are now flying at their dream jobs because our coaches gave them the one-on-one feedback that they needed to succeed on the biggest day of their life. The best part of Spitfire is our community. All Spitfire clients will get access to our private chats where they can work with each other and they can work with our coaches and get the latest information on all the airlines. If you'd like to make sure that you are 100% ready to go on your big day, there is only one choice. Everything you need is in one place and I think it's pretty affordable. You'll have to take a look for yourself. Just go over to SpitfireElite.com and check us out. Use the coupon code podcast and it'll save you 10%. And by the way, I will see you on the next episode. The statements made on this show are my own opinions and do not reflect, nor are they under any direction from my employer.